University. Well, today we're concluding our series, Our Lives and Our Culture. And so today we're talking about our real lives, the lives that we live practically in an everyday world. And so we have two sets of scripture. The first one we've been using as our key scripture, so this is our reminder of who we are. And then Second Peter, chapter 1. Now remember, Peter is writing to Christians just like us, people who are out there living every day in the world, trying to figure out how do I live a godly life. So that is why this series. So let's go. First Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. You are a chosen people. That's us, chosen by God. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. That you may declare the praises of him who calls you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We no longer walk in darkness, now we walk in his wonderful light. Because once we were not a people, but now we are the people of God. We have belonging, we have status. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received Mercy. Look at your neighbor and tell them you have received mercy. Because that is what we have. So Peter says this, dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world, because this world is not our home, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives amongst the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day he visits us. That's who we are. That's the intent that the Father wants us. Now, he, second, now in 2 Peter, he gives us the practical ways to live this out. Here we go. Simon Peter, a servant and power of Jesus Christ, to those who, the, who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, ready for this line? This is an important line. Have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for, God, for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who's called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given to us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by evil desires. For this very reason, because of all of that, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to your goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For these, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he's nearsighted and blind, and has forgotten that he's been purified or cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make, to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fail. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? That's a mouthful, yes? Yes. Mercy it is. But we're going to get through it. We're going to get through it quickly, too. <laughs> Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace and your love for us. And Lord, thank you that Lord, you give us practical ways to live with you in our work a day, every day. So, Father, we bless you and thank you. And Lord, ask, Lord, that you guide us, Lord, as we walk through your word this morning. These things, Father, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, why this series? We've been through this series, and Jesus is going to give us a promise here in a second. So we've been through consumerism, we've been through language, we've been through fear, loneliness, phoniness, busyness, all these things that keep nagging at us, calling at us. But here's Jesus' promise, because he wants us to live the real life that he's given us. And it's in John 10. -10. It's one of the first verses I ever memorized as a kid. Here it is. The thief 
comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Consumerism, language, fear, loneliness, phoniness, consumerism, all the all our culture keeps taking this away from us because it keeps trying to draw us in. But Jesus says, I have come, I have came, that they may have life and have it abundantly. And this the idea behind abundant. Next time you're driving down uh, the great highway or you're walking down the sunset and you look down at the ocean, you see the ocean, the waves keep coming in, they keep coming in, taking out the old, bringing in the new sand. That's abundant life. Constantly refreshed and renewed because the Father doesn't want us to feel defeated and drawn into everything else because everything else comes to steal, kill, and destroy our lives. And so that's why when we talk about Christ and culture, Christ says, culture says this, but this is how I want you to live. Because I ask you to be in the world, but not of the world. So, there's four assurances for us about our real lives, our abundant life, the life the Father's promises. This is the first one. In verse 1, the NIV says it a little differently, but here's what Peter's saying here. He's saying that because of God's righteousness, we have the same faith as the disciples. We look at the disciples and we look at them as these super saints, these supermen who come in and they do all these wonderful and, and wonderful things and people get healed and, and as Peter's walking by, you know, the, the, uh, uh, Peter, Peter walks by and his shadow falls on a man and the man gets healed. Or Peter, uh, Peter and Jane are walking up to the temple and they say, give us some money. He says, what I'm doing? In the name of Jesus Christ, we command you to get up and walk. And we read the stories of the disciples, we read about Paul, and we get all excited. And we say, how come I don't have that kind of faith? Guess what? You do. Because we have the same kind of precious faith. They lived in an oppressive world. They lived in a world that was trying to get, get them to live the way the world lived. But they decided they're going to live differently because of what God had done in their lives. And who God and what God was doing in their lives. That's why Peter goes out of his way to say, "You have the same kind of precious faith as we do," which then means we have the same kind of power available to us. Remember, we learned a week ago that the Father has not given us a spirit of fear, of falseness, of timidity, but a spirit of power. His dunamis, His Spirit lives within us. That's the first one. We have the same faith as the disciples. Why? Because of the righteousness of God. God doesn't say, you guys over here, I'm going to give you a whole lot of faith. You're just going to be so good. You're going to be super saints. You guys here, you know, you're going to be the folk who are just kind of getting by, you know. Your faith is okay. You know, it, it, it will do. And then over here, you guys are going to have weak faith. You know, I don't care how hard you pray. Don't, don't worry about it. It's, it's just going to be mediocre. No, that's not what God says at all. He says, I'm giving each one of you the same kind of power, the same kind of faith, the same kind of spiritual authority that I have given the disciples. Why? Because it is the Spirit of God Himself that lives in us because of His righteousness. Amen? Amen. The second one is this one. This is fun. Verse 2. The ability to grow in Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is the way Peter puts it. What's he saying? He says, God does not want us to leave us as babies, but he wants us to grow up into him. God does not leave us in the place where he meets us. Paul picks up on that idea in Colossians. He says, we want to, in Colossians 1.28, we want to present every man, every woman, complete in Christ. What's he saying? It? We want you to grow and mature in Christ. But here's the key. Grow takes time. Many of you are parents. And you remember when your child was just a little darling, little baby like Kai here, you hold him in your arms, just eat him and stuff and so on. And then they start growing, they start getting independent. They get to do different things. That's what the Father says, I want in your life. I want you to grow like that. I want you to grow whole. I want you to grow complete. Remember, the Father says we are his plantings. The Father wants us to be his oaks of righteousness. 
Our church is privileged. We go to two different camps, and they both give us the same illustration. First one is Happy Valley down in Santa Cruz, and the other one is down in uh, Lomar with uh, Redwood Glen. You go in and you see these beautiful redwoods. They grow with, and they they they, grow, they start out these little tiny little green things sticking out of the ground, and, but suddenly years later they're reaching to the sky and they have this girth and might and they sway in the wind and they don't fall down. Why? Because their root structure goes down. Their root structure spreads out. Why? Because they're gripping the earth. And that's the idea. The Father says, as you grow in me, I want you to grip me, grow in me, take deep root in me. Then they grow taller, they go grow, they, 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 slow down. <laughs> they, they have girth about them, which is their strength. Because what's happening there is their bark begins to get thick because their bark begins to repel the insects that try to destroy, destroy the tree. And what happens there in our spiritual lives is as we're go growing in Christ, we begin to realize the things in our lives that come to destroy our lives, so we're able to repel them. Why? Because we're growing in Him. The third thing about these trees is that these trees begin to reproduce. They begin to re reproduce after their own kind. A redwood tree cannot produce an oak tree. Why? Because it's a redwood tree. If we're Christians, we begin to reproduce the people, the, that kind of life and the people around us. Why? Because they're in our oikos. We pray for them. They rub shoulders with them. We rub, sho they, we rub shoulders together. We break bread there. We have relationships together. Why? Because as we're growing in Christ, they get to see Christ, Jesus, and us because we get to model who the Father is. This is the third one. We have every, this is a nice one. I heard this one the first time. I thought, are you serious? But here it is. We have everything we need for life and godliness. Say that with me. I have, I have everything, everything I need, I need for, life for life and godliness. godliness. How does that happen? God's power has done that. The Father says, I will supply all of your needs. This is an important verse because he's given us everything. For life. We don't have to go out and prove ourselves to him. We have abundant life for us. We just have to say, yes, Jesus, I will receive it. We have everything we need for godliness. We don't have to go out and fake it because you cannot fake godliness. Godliness is going to come out of you because if it's in you, it's going to shine out of you. Why? Because it is the Father. It is his power in us. Godliness is the ability to walk with him. Why? Because he has called us unto himself. And as he calls us unto himself, then he gives us his power. He gives us his spirit that we may be full of him. Why? Because it's right there in the next verse. Verse 4. Remember, he's given us everything we need for life and godliness. Then he says, you are a partaker of the divine nature. The three things packed into verse 4. We're not going to unpack the whole thing. But here they are real quick. The three things are one, we have the precious, that means the costly promises of Jesus. The second thing is, we have escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. You know, because we're not consumed by our own lust because of the righteousness of God in us. We can't <coughs> say no to our lustful thinking. But then the key here is, we, because of his power, because of the promises of Christ, we become partakers of the divine nature, participants in. We are part of the divine nature. Why? Because we are walking, living, breathing sanctuary of the Holy Spirit. If you're not tired of me saying that by now, shame on you. Amen? Amen. Because that is exactly what we are. Walking, living, breathing sanctuaries of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Father has taken up residence in our hearts. Here's how Paul puts it, first of all, in 1 Corinthians 5. He says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, new things have come. What's he saying there? When God comes into our life, when we allow the Father to come into our life, and we begin to grow in Him, abundant life begins. 
because we say no to the old stuff, we're saying yes to Jesus. As we say yes to the Father, the old passes away like the tree. You begin to grow like the child. You begin to grow up because new things have come. What's new? Before, as he says in, in, in 1 Peter, before you had not received mercy. Now you have received mercy. That is new. Mercy is the forgiveness of God. It means I don't have to walk with the guilt and the shame and all of those things that come with that kind of lifestyle. The Father says, no, new things have come. What's come? Freedom, hope, deliverance, joy. Here's the next one. It says this. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, that you're not your own? Yeah, it's my body. I like to think that, but my body belongs to the Father. Why? Because we are all temples of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives within us because all things have become new. Therefore, we are partakers in, we are part of the divine nature because the Father himself lives within us. Then, because of those four things, one, same faith, precious faith. Second, because we get to grow in Christ Jesus. Third, because we have everything we need for life and godliness. We don't have to fake it. We don't have to prove ourselves to God. God says, I will provide, and I have provided. And then four, we are partakers of the divine nature. Now he gets to eight practical characteristics for what our lives should be like. As he begins this, he says something wonderful for us. Because, you know, as you, read, you ever read scripture? You're just reading along, you know, you just read, yeah, you read, 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 And you read it, and then suddenly you, you go back and you say, I missed that. But I read it before. Yeah, but you missed it. Because we, get to, we miss a key verse right here as he begins this list for us. And you know what it is? It's simply right there at the beginning. He says, apply all diligence. He says, Make every effort to do this. Apply diligence. Because what happens is, in our work a day, every day world, we forget to be diligent. Diligent is keep at it. Make every effort to. Let me begin to do this more often. I can tell when my soul is spiritually hungry. I sit down and start reading my Bible, and the next thing you know, I've read two or three chapters. Next thing you know, I've read a whole book. Then I go back and read it again. Why? Because my soul is saying, you need to do this a little more often. Do Why? Because spiritual hunger takes place. Because we have to be consistent to grow. We have to be making effort. Because everything around us wants our attention. Us is making effort to do this. So here it is. First of all, first one is this. Faith. Make every effort in your faith. Now we all go, yeah, I got faith. Yeah, that's true. But here's the deal. Uh, the idea. Begin to deepen your walk with the Father. Which means to trust Him. Give your faith real importance in your life. Don't take it for granted. Don't just say, oh, yeah, yeah I believe in Jesus. Oh, yeah, everything's going to work out okay. I'll, I'll do better. No. <coughs> Lord, in my life... Let me make the acronym for faith real. Forsaking all, I take him. But help that to become real in my life. That, Lord, my life of faith is not just words, but it is action. That, Lord, I actually trust you. To that, to your faith, then, supply moral excellence. Now, moral excellence gets translated several different ways. But what moral excellence really means is supply goodness. Goodness. And here's the idea. Goodness is a behavioral issue. It means excellence in practical life issues. It's not just having a good heart or being good-hearted or having a big heart. No. It means to be good in practical things. It's a decision to walk in goodness, to do good things, to let the Spirit of God leak out of you in such ways that you bless people. That's doing good things. 
because it's a behavioral issue. Lord, in my life, I need a behavioral change because, Lord, sometimes in my life, I'd rather just do my own selfish desire. That's not good. Lord, sometimes in my life, I just want to be left alone. That's loneliness. That's not goodness. Lord, in my life, create in me the idea that, Lord, I can do behavior by being good in relationships with the people around me. That, Father, good things happen because you're at work because, Father, we're supplying moral excellence, goodness, right thinking, doing right. To your moral excellence or to your goodness, add knowledge. Now, knowledge, you know, if I throw that one in there in the middle of that whole thing, you know, it's simple. Because what happens is, he wants us to understand practical knowledge. There's two kinds of knowledge. The first kind of knowledge, you know a lot of stuff. Amen? Go ahead and say amen. You know you. Amen. Sometimes you're the smartest person in the room. Because you know a lot of stuff. And that's nice to know a lot of stuff. But all the time, your stuff isn't always... Worth nothing. <laughs> That's my day, my friend David and I and a couple others, we play trivial pursuit. And you know, you get in the zone, you throw out all these answers and these, these things that who cares what Mickey Mouse's original name was? You know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. That's a lot of knowledge. James tells us here. James says that love, that knowledge puffs up. Makes you a big head. <clears throat> But there's a lot of knowing, a lot of stuff. But what he's after here is knowledge, which is this. James in the rest of that verse says, love edifies. That I grow enough in Christ Jesus that I just don't know him knowing a lot of stuff. But that I have a personal relationship with him that when I need the word of God, the spirit of God, the sword of the Spirit brings that word to mind. It means, too, that I know Jesus well enough that when my best friend is in trouble, I know how to pray. Or when, when someone I don't know needs a word from God, the, I hear the word of God speaking in my mind. I've been able to say it out of my mouth. Why? Because of my relationship with Jesus. Why? Because I have practical knowledge that goes to work that helps people understand who and what God is doing. To your knowledge, add self-control. Come on, Pete, what are you doing to us? Simple. Self-control is nothing more than self-mastery. Do I master my tongue? God, control my tongue. Do I control my language? Lord, Help me to take hold of myself so that, Lord, I know how to say no to all the distractions around me. Lord, help me to say no to the things that are going to destroy me. Remember, Jesus again, John 10, 10, everything else comes to steal, kill, and destroy your life. But what is stealing my life? But what is stealing my time on, my, on a daily basis? Lord, what are the things that are leading me away from you? Lord, help me here. Lord, give me self-mastery, self-control, discipline. The old word would be temperance. To that, add this. <coughs> add perseverance. Now remember, at the top he says, be diligent. Make sure you do these things. So how do you get to perseverance? You get to perseverance because there are times when you just got to hang in there. Amen? Amen? I mean, life is hard sometimes. And you're like, Lord, what are you doing? Lord, I need you now. And the Lord shows up. Lord, there's trouble. Lord, I need your peace. The Lord gives you peace. Lord, I'm restless. I don't know what to do. The Lord says, I'm here. Hang in there. Because here's what happens. If you don't hang in there, you begin to make a series of compromising decisions that lead you astray, and the next thing you know, you're going, there's no God. God left me. I don't know what to do. 
The movie The Shack is out, and several of us went to see it a couple of days ago. And I was impressed with how they portrayed the main character, McKinsey. McKinsey goes to church. Like everybody else, he shows up. Church culture, you gotta go to church. But then suddenly a couple things start happening in his life, and so he, his face starts getting weak because he doesn't hang in there. Then there's a, the big incident, or I forget what they call it, the trouble or something like that. And there's a big incident in his life, and suddenly he's mad at God. It's okay to be mad at God. I've been mad at God a couple times in my life, too. But it persevered. Because he just gives up. Now, he gives up because he's in pain. But see, he didn't give up. That wasn't a decision, I'm in pain now, I'm giving up. It was a decision that started before that. Because suddenly there was a couple of compromises, a couple of issues. And he just kind of, oh, maybe, maybe not. I don't know if I need to hang in there on that one. Here's the key. If I hang in there on the small thing, when the big things come, I, can, I know that the Father can handle them because he's handled the small things. When the big thing stares his ugly face in my face, then I'm able to run to my father, who's then able to give me the faith again to hang in there. Because remember, three times we got faith. Same faith as the disciples. Then we have the ability to be diligent in your faith. In other words, Make sure you're walking by faith, not giving it to compromise, so that when the big issue comes, you know exactly where you're going to stand. Why? Because the Father is there with you. Perseverance. To your perseverance, then, add godliness. There's godliness again. Why is that there again? It's there again because it's a reminder that it cannot be faith, because each one of these Characteristics builds upon the other. If I've got self-mastery, if I'm persevering, if I'm dealing with my faith, if I'm dealing with practical knowledge, knowledge that helps people, knowledge that helps me, then I'm godly. Godliness is going to leak out of me. Then to that, to your godliness, to your life before the Father, your life with the Father, supply brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness is simply Philadelphia. We all know that. No, you don't want to become a good... <laughs> Brotherly kindness means, how am I doing in the relationships with the people that I have around me? Am I honoring those relationships? Or do I cut people to ribbons? Do I condescend them to death? What am I doing? Brotherly kindness means that I'm being kind to my brother because they are a person who needs Christ's love too. Yeah, they may hurt you, but they're still your brother, they're still your sister. Brotherly kindness. Then he, he takes Philadelphia and he marries it to agape. So you got Philos, Philadelphia, to agape, brotherly kindness. In your brotherly kindness, and agape. Dude, here's agape. Agape is God's love flowing through you. It's love without cost. It's love without fear. And so what happens with agape is, first of all, I've got to love those invisible people in my life. That would be the least of these. Those people that we ignore. Those people that we don't think are very nice. I love those people. <laughs> encourage those people. Except for the grace of God, the idea as well. Then I've got to agape those people that I'm jealous about. They've got a little more than I do. You know, they seem to have a little more confidence than I do. i got to agape them. Why? There's no reason for me to be jealous of them. They're people just like I am. God has blessed them that way. He hasn't blessed me that way yet. That's okay. Because if I'm not God behaving them, I'm not jealous. Then the third one is, I've got to agape those who are my enemies. Pray for those who hurt you. Who abuse you? Pray for them. 
who hurtfully, who despise you. Why? They end at God's Why? Because as you love them, you heap burning coals on their head. What that means is you begin to bless them. You begin to purge out of them the very stuff there. Why? Because you're loving them. Then he wraps that up with this. It says this. If these qualities are yours and increasing, they render you fruitful in the kingdom of God. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Why? Because you shine with the Father. You glow. You are his person. Why? Well, it's natural. You're God's fruit tree. You know, John 15, bury God's fruit. But if they are not yours, then you're blind or short-sighted because you've forgotten something very important. What have you forgotten? You've forgotten and become blind to your own forgiveness of sin. Look in your own life. What's the sin there? That if somebody in church stood up and said, do you know what so-and-so did? You'd crawl under the seats and make your way out the door in your belly because you were so embarrassed. But that's what the enemy wants. That's where the enemy wants you to live. But you've forgotten that you've been forgiven for that. You've forgotten that Jesus has opened your eyes. You've forgotten that Jesus says, everything comes to steal, kill, and destroy your life. I'm come that you may have life and have it to the fullest. Just live for me. Don't let culture rule your heart. Don't let shame and guilt rule your heart. Be fruitful. Let me live. Lord Jesus, forgive us for those times when, Lord, we have been forgetful. Lord, when we've been blind. Lord, when we have forgotten that you have cleansed us, you have forgiven us. Because, Lord, it's those times when our own forgetfulness, our own blindness gets in the way about living our real lives. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters this morning, that, Father, you would speak into our hearts. That, Lord, more and more we would live our real lives before you. Lives of confidence, lives of surety, because Lord, we live lives of faith, because we have the same faith <clears throat> as the disciples had. That, Lord, we would know that we're partakers of, divine, of the divine nature. The Lord, we've escaped the corruption of the world. The Lord, these characteristics would be ours and growing. That Father, our people around us would see and know that Lord, we belong to you. So Lord, this week, this week, Lord, we think this message through. Help us to answer the questions in our worship for Are you being fruitful? I have been forgotten. Forgive us. For forgiveness. These things, Lord Jesus, we pray in the holy, your mighty blessing.